there's another door to the right. Uh, just go in there, and there's another bathroom back there. That one's working fine, as far as I know, right now. Okay, so uh, please help us with that if you possibly can. Uh, all right, we ready to go? All right. Well, I know it's not a competition. <laughs> But the guys, we did great last Saturday. But you ladies really did great. Boys too. I'm, I'm so glad that we. Ask for how many they got from under the bridge.
Jay? Oh, Jay Bell? Yes, ma'am. A phrase. A phrase? Our prayers are being answered as we speak. A gal that's been in the hospital with COVID, they put her on a ventilator. She is every day getting a little bit better. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the
for your honor and for your glory. Lord, I ask you to bless now your message tonight. Be with me, Lord, as I try to bring it. Give me the power and the strength and the wisdom to know how to teach your word tonight in a way that you have it taught. Now, God, just bless our visitors. Be with those who could not be here tonight without no hindering cause. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Debbie Bible tonight. Turn to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. I have something all lined out to uh, do tonight. Uh, I was going to be in the book of Psalms. And that worked out real good so God changed my mind. <laughs> so I learned a long time ago when God leads, you better follow. Amen? Amen. Or it'll be wrong. So Nehemiah chapter number one. Nehemiah chapter number one. We're going to begin reading with verse number one. Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. You there say amen. 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 All right. The words of Nehemiah, the son of the Hitchite, that it came to pass in the month of Jeb, that the twentieth year, as I was in Shinshan, the palace, that Hanai, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, and which were left uh, of captive concerning and, uh, and which of the left of captive and the concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant that were left of the captive there in the parliament are in great affliction and reproach. And the walls of Jerusalem also are broken down, and the gates there are, therefore are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept, and I mourned certain days, and I fasted, and I prayed before God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, thy great and terrible God, that keepeth the covenant and the mercy uh, for them, and that love him and observe his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before and you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you, both I and my father's house have sinned. The word the Bible said came to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in Shinshad, the, the palace, he was working there as a cupbearer for the king, which was a very uh, high position in the kingdom. In other words, the cupbearer job, if you are not familiar with it, was that anything that was brought to the king to eat or drink, the cupbearer had to eat and drink of it first. So that nobody could slip in and poison. So if Nehemiah drank something and fell over dead, the king knew better to drink it, right? <laughs> so he was, he was very important in, in his kingdom. And so the, they had some visitors there, and they I'm giving you the redneck version of it now. They had some visitors there from uh, Jerusalem that came to the palace. So Nehemiah asked them, what about the captive? What about those that are still left in Jerusalem? And what about Jerusalem itself? And Nehemiah, and they told Nehemiah this. They said, the people are in reproach. He said, they're, they're, they're being uh, tormented day and night. And not only that, but the walls of the city have been destroyed. Even the gates have been burned with fire. Now, those walls had an important thing. In their, in their life. Walls in that day meant protection. <coughs> it meant that they could be protected from their enemy. The enemy could not get in and harm them as long as the walls stood and they were able to hold the enemy back. 
But once those walls were torn down, once those gates were burned, there was nothing to stop the enemy from coming in and, and, and destroying them or killing them or putting them into slavery, which they were very uh, much like to do back in those days. They used a lot of the Jews as slaves to build and the great temples and the great cities that they uh, built back in those days. So slavery has been around for a long time. You know, folks talk about slavery and they think, oh, we, you know, we're under slavery. Uh, and it just started back in the, you know, 30s or back in the 40s or whatever. But slavery's been around since the beginning of time. People have you, and it's not had anything to do with race. It has to do with the fact that when somebody takes that person against their will and makes them do something that they don't want to do, kind of like what we are in America today, amen? amen. I mean, they're, they're getting to that point where we're going through those same things. They're telling us what we can do and what we cannot do, and we're getting reproached just like the children of Israel. Amen. So the children of Israel had this problem. They were reproached, and, you know, a lot of our churches are going through that today. They don't like our churches. They don't like our God that we serve. And so they will make a lot of comments about us. Uh, we went to Snyder to see a dermatologist, and uh, my wife just had to go in to Dollar Tree. <laughs> we, we were making a point of Dollar Tree. If you're ever in Snyder going to Dollar Tree, tell the, the uh, cashier behind the the counter, have a blessed day. She does not like that at all. <laughs> she calls one of our ladies, but she's a freak because she told her she had a blessed, uh, a blessed day. <laughs> there are folks out there that are, are against us, folks. And the devil himself would like nothing better than to cause our church to fall and to cause problems in our church. And the worst thing he wants is see this revival come and our folks get excited about the things of God. So he's going to do everything he can to try to stop that and keep us from having a tremendous time during that week with Brother Mark. So people, we're in reproach just like everybody else. We're going through a lot of trouble. Uh, we were listening to the news today, and there is some 60,000 more coming across the border and into our country. Folks, our country is getting into sad shape. We're just like the, the children of Israel. Uh, our walls are broke down. Our, our guard is down. The enemy is coming in, and they're going to take over if God doesn't intervene pretty soon. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican or whether you're for them or whether you're against them. I'm just telling you that if we don't stand up for the things of God and we don't stand up for America and do what we need to do and be the kind of Americans that God wants us to be, we're going to lose our country and the devil's going to take control. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Nehemiah said, you know, the, the walls are burned down, the gates are there. Many uh, of us are in reproach today, but, you know, Nehemiah knew what to do about it. Amen? He knew about to do about it. The Bible says he began to pray. He began to pray. Notice what he said. He said in verse number 5, I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, great and terrible God, keep thy covenant and mercy for them and love him and observe his commandments. He said, he began to pray. You know, Nehemiah's prayer, if you've ever looked at it and broke it down, it contains six steps. You know, a lot of us don't know how to pray. We know how to say, Lord, I hope everything's going to be all right. That's <laughs> not praying. There's a lot of conditions to prayer. And there's a lot of ways of doing prayer. And Nehemiah gave us an outline of how to get a hold of God and how to pray. And if we'll study this guideline and use them, but you might want to make note of this in your life so you know that your prayers are going to be answered. Number one, we find that he was very earnest about his prayer. You know, you've got to be sincere when you ask God. Be specific. Ask God 
exactly what you want. I use the phrase sometimes, you know, we, we pray for a new car. Ask God for a Cadillac. It's okay. Be specific. Now, he may laugh at you and give you a Ford, but, you know, <laughs> but you need to be specific. When we pray about a loved one or somebody that's, had, that's lost and not done without crying, lift that person up to God. Be specific. Say, God, I want you to touch that person's heart. I want to see them saved. I want to see them follow the Lord in baptism. I want to see them get in and go to work for God and watch their life be transformed into a new life. But you got to be sincere. you got to be earnest. Oh, uh, Nehemiah, he was earnest about his prayer. And then he, he, you know, he knew God. Now you think, well, what, what's that have to do with him? Do you understand something? The only prayer that God will ever hear from a lost person is a prayer of salvation. That's it. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never been, never accepted Christ. You're not a born again child of God. Your name's not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can pray from now until eternity, and God's not going to hear your prayer. I hear people saying, "Paul, oh, you know, I prayed. It. It God didn't answer my prayer." Well, do you know God? I kid some of the guys out there on the golf course. They'll, they'll play something about God, and I'll say, you know, you might want to know who you're talking to because if you don't know him, he's not going to answer. Nehemiah knew who God was. <coughs> he had God in here, not just here. A lot of people got a head knowledge of, of God. They got a head knowledge of what, how to live, you know, they're trying to live a good life. They're trying to do their best, you know. They may even put money in the altar plate on Sunday morning. They may come and sit on a pew in church and still only have a head knowledge of God instead of a heart knowledge. Amen. You don't know God here. You know God here. Amen. And Nehemiah knew God in his heart. He knew who God was. And not only did he know who God was, but the Bible says he persevered in his prayer. We pray and say, God, I hope you give us a good revival next week. And then that's the end of it. I pray. Not God point out and answer. He prayed continuously. He prayed earnestly. He prayed without ceasing, like the Bible said. So if God doesn't answer your prayer right now, you need to continue to pray until He answers your prayer. Because He will answer. Because God only answers prayer in three ways. He says yes, and of course that's all we're looking for, right? We just want the yes. Or he says, wait. And gosh, no, we don't want that one, right? We don't like spending time in that hallway. We want God to answer our prayers, but we want to do it like McDonald's. We want it right now. We want it right now. And then the last one, sometimes he says no. And boy, we sure don't like that one, do we? That's why when you pray, you know how to really be earnest and sincere to pray to God? <clears throat> when you start your prayer, start it this way. Lord, if it be your will. Amen. So sometimes we get above what God wants for us to do. Sometimes we start praying for our own selfish will. <laughs> I like the story that I heard about the guy praying to win the revival, uh, win the lottery. He was sincere and he was learning. He prayed every day. God let me win the lottery. Lord, I'll do this, I'll do that, do this. Let me win the lottery. Finally, the Lord got tired of it and he said, I'll tell you what, then. 
<clears throat> Meet me halfway. Buy a ticket. <laughs> you see, sometimes we want God's prayer answered without any footsteps or without any effort on our part. Sometimes God answered our prayers through our action. Because prayer without action avails nothing. Sometimes we have to put feet with our prayer. You pray for the soul of somebody that's lost, that don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Have you went over and talked to them about it? <clears throat> have you ever asked them if you want to die right now? Do you know beyond a shadow of doubt where you spend your eternity? I mean, they could they're either going to say yes or no or get there at the door. <laughs> but one thing about it, when they stand before God, they cannot say to God, no one ever told me about Christ. Amen. Nobody ever gave me an opportunity to get saved because so-and-so came over to my house one night or one day or came to my job site. <clears throat> And ask me if I would accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So not only just pray for him, sometimes you need to act on that prayer. He he was concerned. He was sincere. He was he the Bible said he per persevered. And then he made a confession. Uh oh. It's going to be a little quiet right here. Okay? Just bear with me. I'll get through this and I'll move on. If you've got sin in your life, or there's something standing between you and God, God's not going to hear your prayer. He's not going to answer. So you've got to get your heart right with God before God's going to hear your prayer. This old-fashioned altar that we have down here in front is one of the greatest places that you can ever make things right with God. You get all those things done in your life. What did Nehemiah say? He said, they have sinned before God. And he said, I have sinned before God. I confess my sin, God. Now, <coughs> I've asked you, I've confessed my sin, I've asked you to forgive me. Now I hear my prayer. See, when you get your heart right with God and you get just all those things in your life that's standing between you and God out of the way, you open up the floodgates of heaven for God to answer your prayer. But you have to get all those things out of your way. Have your heart right with God. <coughs> Nehemiah had to get things right. He had to pray not only for himself, he prayed for the people. Because if God was going to help them, they had to also get rid of those things in their lives. So he, he made a confession. Then he claimed God's promise. You see, when you pray, and you ask God for something in your life, well, if it might, let, let's talk about healing for just a moment. All of them. Got folks that needs a touch from God. They may be family members, they may be friends, they may be us personally. When you pray for healing in your life, claim it. <clears throat> count it right, count it down. Well, what do we do? Oh, God, I sure hope you'll help me. I got to go do this, and I got to go do that. And I don't know how it's going to all come out, but I hope you'll be with me. And, I mean, we just moan and groan and cry like a little bitty baby. That's not trust in God. When you trust God, pray. God, I've got a problem in my life. I need a healing hand placed upon me. God, touch me, heal me. Now, Lord, thank you for doing it. 
Because God's will will always be done. It may not be the way you want it done. You know, I go into a home or hospital room or somebody that maybe on hospice. Then they'll call me and want me to come in and pray with them. And there's, there's not one prayer you can pray in a position like that. You pray, Lord, your will be done. <coughs> I mean, you don't know, no sit and fall on the floor and crying and screaming and kicking and, and dragging at the, at the bedside for them to rise up and, and walk. When it comes your time, when God is ready, we'll just let His will be done. Just His will be done. Sometimes it don't always work out the way we want it to. Or sometimes it does. And you bring comfort and you reach strength to those around you. So he confessed and claimed God's promises, and then he held God's. To his promise. See, God has promised you something. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. That's God's promise. If you'll ask, <coughs> putting everything else aside, doing it the way God wants you to do it, God said, I will answer. <coughs> I will answer. God is ready to answer your prayer today, but you have to be willing to believe that he will. And then, notice, it has to go to chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, and I don't have time to read that tonight. But he did. God did answer Nehemiah's prayer. He was willing for God to use him answer his prayer. How did God answer his prayer? He sent Nehemiah. Nehemiah came in to the king. And the Bible said his countenance was sad. In other words, it was almost a death penalty to go before the king with anything but a smile on your face. Nehemiah couldn't smile. He couldn't look happy. And the king knows. It. But the king had compassion on Nehemiah. You know why? Nehemiah had already made the preparations. And God had already intervened into that king's heart. Nehemiah, the king asked him, said, Nehemiah, what's going on? What's the problem? Nehemiah told him. He confessed. You know, he said, the uh, children are in reproach. The walls of Jerusalem are torn down. The gates are burned with fire. The king said, okay, Nehemiah, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Nehemiah asked the king. He said, king, just give me a letter and let me go. Give me a letter and let me go. Now that letter had a king's seal on it. It gave Nehemiah the authority to go wherever he needed to go with the king's authority behind him. And without that, Nehemiah wouldn't have been able to accomplish what he was able to accomplish. And Nehemiah <coughs> went to Jerusalem. He gathered the dead people together. And he said, all right, folks, let's do it. We got some walls to build. We got some gates that need to be redone. And you know what the people said? God said they had a mind and a will. God had already prepared the heart of the king. He prepared the heart of the people. And then he brought Nehemiah down to oversee the building 
and they built those walls back in Jerusalem and put <coughs> Jerusalem back into the safety and took those people out of reproach and got them back in the will of God. That's what will happen when you're sincere and you're honest about the things of God. And you're willing not only to pray, but you're willing to put your feet to the test. God may be wanting to use you in a great mighty way during this next few weeks. Like I said, we're going to start tonight. We're going to pray on Sunday morning uh, during our invitation for our revival. God said, maybe he wants you to put some feet to that prayer. <coughs> maybe you got a neighbor or somebody you work with or a family member you that don't go to church anymore. <clears throat> Maybe God's going to use you to bring them that week to the revival. And you see, if you bring them, it's God's obligation to do His will in their life. You can't, you know, I, I, I said, I've been in services where I wanted to walk down the aisle and grab somebody by the hand and drag them down that aisle to the altar. That's not the way God works. All I can do is preach the message the best I know how. Holy Spirit's the one that's going to convict your heart. But you're going to have to be the one that puts work to your prayer and walk down that aisle and do what God wants you to do. Have you been to that place? Are you under your tonight? Do you feel like God is not answering your prayer? Take these simple little steps that Nehemiah took, and you'll see the result that Nehemiah saw when he built that city back to the place that God wanted him to be. Let's stand tonight. We got some walls to build. Our walls may not be down, but we got some pews that could be filled. We got some empty spaces that God wants people to be in. And it's our job, folks, to go into the highway and head and tell them to come in God's house and be filled. Would you be a worker for God tonight? Will you be one of those that go out and say, not only am I praying for this revival this week, not am I praying for that person, but I'm willing to go that extra mile and invite them to come and be a part of the service. I'm just sending them a text message, but I'm talking about one-on-one, -on -one, where you can look from eyeball to eyeball and say, I want you to be a part of our revival. Come and be a part of it. Will you work for that this week? Our Father, we thank you so much for this service tonight. Lord, I again thank you for the good music we've had. Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. God, I hope that it's touched our hearts tonight, starting with my own. Lord, may I confess anything that's standing between me and you tonight. And God, may you hear our prayer. God, that we pray and we're believing tonight, God, that you're going to answer those prayers. And God, that we're going to see a tremendous week during our revival. But Lord, it can start even this coming Lord's Day. Maybe there's somebody that we need to go talk to. Lay that person on our heart this week. God, give us that opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this service tonight. Thank you for thee that took time out to come and be a part of your service tonight. Thank you for our visitors. Lord, what a privilege it has been tonight to have them in our service. Lord, we pray that we've been a blessing to them as much as they've already blessed us by just being here tonight. Now go with us to our home. 
bring us all back to thy house this coming Lord's Day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.